Travel all over the countryside, Oscar Leyland, Oscar Leyland. Travel all over the countryside, Oscar Leyland, brother. Whatever it is that you want to see, Oscar Leyland, Oscar Leyland. No matter whatever that happens to be, Oscar Leyland, brother. Come on, me in and then join in the fun. Travel all over Australia. Step back into the past with us, as we find a man with a very unusual occupation. He restores old horse-drawn vehicles, such as Cobb & Co coaches, here at Mullaney in Queensland. Then we go bushwalking in the Warrumbungle National Park in northern New South Wales here, through the spectacular ranges formed by volcanoes millions of years ago. And then we're off to the North Island of New Zealand to photograph up-to-date volcanic activity, the boiling mud and hot water of Rotorua. We're not at an old ghost town in the outback. We're actually only 50 miles from Brisbane at Mullaney. We're here because Sean Hennessy of Namor in Queensland asked us if we could show the man who repairs all these old horse-drawn vehicles and brings them right up to mint condition. Seems a bit hard to believe that these wagons that are here and carriages that I'm standing beside could be turned into a new vehicle, but in this shed behind me is where the work's carried out. Jeff Ernst is an old-style craftsman, teaching his sons Jeff and Peter. At Carter's Horse-Drawn Vehicle Company, they work with traditional tools to restore century-old horse-drawn vehicles. Uh, this is a straight shaft sulky with new shafts, original ironwork, uh, which would be uh, older than the Cobb and Cow coach, and the ironwork, which would be hard to duplicate now because uh, it was all hand-forged. Any of the uh, steelwork that is too rusted or pitted is, is replaced. Jeff and Peter fit a restored foot tray to the undercarriage of a straight shaft sulky. All types of horse-drawn vehicles are restored with loving care by Jeff and his sons. Jeff is fitting a hood bow to this Cobb & Co coach. Carter's horse-drawn vehicle company has been in operation for two years. It is the brainchild of Harvey Carter who travels all over Australia in search of forgotten old vehicles to restore to their original beauty. Harvey then finds a buyer and the vehicles begin a new and useful life. This coach is destined for a tourist complex in New Zealand, where it will be used to give people a taste of coach travel as it was at the turn of the century. What's this in here, Jeff? Uh, that is uh, what they call the boot for the coaches. and. Uh carried the mail, mail bags, small luggage and the valuables uh, for the uh, customers, the passengers. And this is an old Cobb & Co coach you're it restoring, is, is it? Yes, yeah, original. Well, most of it is original and we're just restoring it back to its original state. The wheels for the coach need some new sections. Jeff Jr. replaces the fillies before a new steel tyre is fitted. The steel tyre is 12 millimetres smaller than the wheel. The tyre must be expanded by heat before it is fitted. The steel tyres are made on the premises to suit various wheels. Water stops the wood burning and cools the metal. As the tyre contracts, it tightens the whole wheel and pulls it into shape.
almost as old as steel tyres, are rubber ones. This old retire came from a blacksmith shop in Charters Towers. The tyre has a wire through it, which is used to tighten and hold the tyre on the rim. Rubber is quieter than steel on the road and was more popular on ladies' carriages. Peter's meticulous paintwork is one of the most important finishing touches. What is this you're doing, Jim? Uh, this is a, a cushion for a, a carriage uh, made with leather and stuffed with uh, horse hair. Uh, it is very rare to see traditional deep button upholstery today. Jeff is probably the only person in Australia practicing this unusual craft. The man whose ideas began all this is Harvey Carter. Harvey, what gave you the idea of uh, starting to rebuild old horse-drawn carriages? Well, originally in the first place, uh, Mike, it was for my own pleasure entirely. And then when I found out that uh, Jeff Ernst would come along with me and I realised then that we had the expertise to be able to do these vehicles up and restore them to their original condition and sell them. Over here we have um, a sulky and that's known as a Phaeton sulky and the reason for that of course is that it's a lady sulky and this vehicle also has a kiddie seat so the kiddies could ride back the front with mother and father sitting in there. A little thing that's of particular interest, I think, and would be to a lot of people, is this particular light, and this is a very fine light. Most of these lights were candles. This one is kerosene, the only one I've ever seen with a spotlight. Harvey's greatest pleasure is driving the old English Phaeton. His horse, Ross E., loves these Main Street jaunts, as do the lucky passengers who ride in a carriage from the past. A growing number of Australians are driving for pleasure. It is they who buy most of Harvey's vehicles. The townsfolk of Mullaney are used to sites like this, as Harvey and his team have restored about 40 horse-drawn vehicles. Do you get many people coming through the town here wanting to see the operation and how you work with the vehicles? Yes, Mike, a considerable number of people come through, but unfortunately they uh, just impede our work. We are very, uh, they're very welcome to come here, but we find that we can't get sufficient production uh, so that we're going to shift our complex down onto the highway. Uh, we feel that uh, we're restoring part of Australia's heritage and we feel that everyone in Australia should be able to come and see the men working. And if we can go down there, well, we'll find it will pay us a lot better because the people will get the larger number of people, whereas here we only get a few. And as I say, those that do come in, they're very welcome, but they do stop us from getting our full production. Well, thanks, Harvey. And thank you, Sean Hennessy, for telling us all about Harvey Carter's horse-drawn vehicle company. About 35 kilometres west of Coonabarabran in northern New South Wales is a spectacular range of mountains known as the Warrumbungles. This craggy range of past volcanic activity now lies within the 18,000 hectare Warrumbungle National Park and we have come here to answer a request from Mrs M World of Ringwood in Victoria who visited the park about four years ago by car. Well, in her letter, Mrs. World goes on to say, unfortunately, my husband hurt his foot, so we can only go by car to some of the places. As I thought this was one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen, we were disappointed we couldn't see some of the harder to get to parts of the park. I wonder if it's possible for you to take your cameras to these lovely spots. Well, Mrs. World, that's what we're going to do today. With Carmen, of course, we're limited to just a one-day walk, but we'll show you what you could see if you came to the park and had a full day to walk around it. The walking trails rise very gently at first from the camping grounds and cut through country which is representative of both the dry western plains and the moister eastern coast. Even in winter the walk can work up a sweat, especially in the still air of the gullies dominated by white box trees. The vegetation here includes cypress pine, white gum and even heath on the high tops and therefore supports a wealth of native fauna. 
Koalas moving lazily through the treetops are evident when we stop long enough to have lunch in the sheltered flat country just before the steep rise in the trail. Whenever we stop in the park, the cheeky currawongs always seem to find us. They feed fearlessly within a few feet, snatching up the food scraps we have thrown to them. These well-known birds of the bush seem more friendly than usual here. Perhaps they've become used to the protection afforded by the park since it was permanently reserved as a national park in 1967. Only on the flat bit here, you know, the rise starts about another two kilometres up the road. Mm -hmm. We follow this creek for a little while, then we start rising up. Uh -huh. have to get to yeah. Although our lunch stop was made more pleasant by the glimpses of wildlife, if we expect to reach the high volcanic outcrops within the one day, we must keep moving steadily up the well-defined trails. Well, so far we've reached a spot known as Wilson's Rest, which is on the trail, and it's just before the last part of the climb, before we come up towards the breadknife and some of the more dominant features of the park. But there is another dominant feature of the park, and that's the one behind me here. It's a spire. It's known as Bladgery Spire. And a spire is the correct name that's given to the volcanic plug which was formed when this was originally a volcano. All this area was the centre of a vast volcanic eruption about 13 million years ago. And these plugs, which are known as spires, were formed by the silica-laden uh, lava which was left behind after the rest of the mountain eroded away. When the climb begins, the going is tougher and slower. But it is only when we start to reach above the heavily wooded forest of the lowlands that the dominating features of the Warrumbungle Range is apparent. Probably the most spectacular feature of the park is the wedge-shaped wall of igneous rock known as the bread knife. These vertical sheets of one-time molten rock have been exposed by erosion and are known by geologists as dikes. Mrs. World, we've reached that section of the park known as the Grand High Tops, and it's a very aptly named place. Behind, we were looking straight across at Bladgery Spire, and from here we can look down on the bread knife, back towards the camp where we started from. And over to my left there is the very impressive Crater Bluff. A very aptly named place, as I said. We've just about run out of time now. It's starting to get into the uh, late afternoon light so we'll have to set off back down. But this is about as far as we can go on a day walk. We have reached, I suppose, the peak here, and you can see some of the most spectacular parts of the Warrumbungle National Park. Thank you very much for asking us to take a look at it for you. Most of the North Island of New Zealand lies on a giant thermal fault line. In the south there are volcanoes which have erupted and caused great devastation from time to time. And in the north there are still volcanoes which smoke every now and then. In the middle of all that is Rotorua, an area famous for its thermal activity. And we've come there to answer a request from Angelo and Chris Papacosmos from Wollongong in New South Wales. They've written and asked us if we can show the bubbling mud and geysers of New Zealand. Well, we certainly can show you that. We're going to, but we're going to look deeper. We're going to show how man has been able to utilise the enormous thermal energy and turn it to his own use. Near the Maori village of Waka Wira Wira on the outskirts of Rotorua is a spectacular region of thermal activity, a place where the heat of molten magma within the heart of the earth seems dangerously close to the surface. Here, the centre showpiece is the geyser known by the natives as Pohutu, which means big splash. Pohutu erupts spasmodically, each blast lasting around 20 minutes, when the mineral-laden water comes into contact with the molten rock thousands of feet underground. The strong mineral content has built up an incredible cascade of calcium and limestone crystals, complete with stalactites.
When Pahutu blows, she reaches 250 metres. The pugnant smell of sulphur fills the visitors' nostrils everywhere in Rotorua, but it is especially strong this close to the source. The acidic nature of the fumes has killed most of the vegetation that lies downwind from the geyser. Calcified trees, petrified forever. Perhaps the most fascinating display of nature's strange ways is this giant cauldron of boiling mud. A gurgling melting pot kept active by the heart of the Earth's interior as long as man can remember. The longer one looks at the boiling mud, it is said, the more it starts to look like a giant pit of jumping frogs. The thermal activity at Rotorua is only one of many such places where this strange occurrence comes to the surface of the earth. And all lie in a straight line 240 kilometres long, a fault line in the earth's crust. When flying its length, this lining up factor is immediately evident. The boiling cauldrons of Waka Wiwa that seem somewhat awesome from the ground, look like small pots of boiling water from 300 metres up. Another far more foreboding thermal pool is enormous by comparison. It is on the fault line directly north of Rotorua. Steaming mountains and boiling creeks in a climate renowned for its cold weather. The fault runs across the lake bed, touching on the cliffs at one spot where the escaping steam rises eternally. Further to the north, in the Bay of Plenty, lies the top of the line, the active volcano of White Island in the distant haze. Flying south along the line, we encounter another set of colourful crater-like mud pools and a huge pool of continually boiling water. The fault line runs south from here to the distant snow-covered volcano, Mount Naruahoe, and its nearby companion, emitting ominous traces of smoke. At Rotorua, the community benefits from the thermal activity not only in tourist dollars, but with heating in almost every home and motel. The noted Queen Elizabeth Hospital makes extensive use of the thermal waters in the treatment of patients. The natural spa value of the water draws visitors from all over the world, not only to the hospital, but to the famous Polynesian pools run by Neville Dunn. What have we got here? Where does all this water come from? Well, under the city of Rotorua and suburbs, uh, under a certain section, we have a big strata of rhyolite rock about two to three hundred feet underneath the ground, in which there are hot water streams. Uh, and we put down bores into this rock, and this water comes up uh, under its own pressure and heat into these collecting vats, which we then pump into our thermal bathing complex. Now, this is one of ten bores on the property, which is uh, 321 feet deep, and is delivering about 4,000 gallons an hour of thermal water uh, at 60 pounds per square inch pressure. Uh, this pure alkaline thermal water goes into these vats which you see here and from here we pump the water into the thermal complex for uh, recreational bathing purposes in both public and private pools. 
The therapeutic value to sufferers of arthritis and rheumatism is renowned all over the world. Ten minutes in the superheated spa is enough for most, then it's cool down time in the comparative cool of the 40 degrees Celsius main pool. At Waiaraki, near the centre of the North Island of New Zealand, man has harnessed this excessive display of Mother Earth's power by sinking deep bores into the fault line and tapping the roaring steam. This steam is collected over a vast thermal field and piped a few kilometres to a geothermal powerhouse for the generation of electricity. In these days of world power shortages, a powerhouse that simply taps the inner energy of the Earth seems amazingly simple just part of the fascinating story of the thermal fault line that runs through the North Island of New Zealand. A story we were able to bring you thanks to a request from Angelo and Chris Papakosmos in Wollongong, who wanted to see the boiling mud of Rotorua. Here, the energy of the earth leaks out like a safety valve, providing a fascinating spectacle of nature, all the more interesting in slow motion. Whatever that happens to be, Astralayland Brothers. 